Hi, everybody. So um, I'm going to finish off Chapter 4 by talking about uh, checking cases. Uh, that's a situation where you have a, something that you're trying to explain, and the most natural way to do it is to break it up into pieces and look at each piece separately because things are simpler that way. Uh, two places where this happens a lot is if you're dealing with um, parity issues, like if you have a minus 1 to the n, which is positive if n is even and negative if n is odd. Um, that splits a lot of things up into cases. And another thing which is a notorious case splitter is the absolute value. Uh, so I'm going to look at some examples for, bo for both of these, one from the book and, and one not in the book. So uh, here we go. So the first example, as I mentioned, is from the book. So the, the proposition we're asked to consider is if n is a natural number, show that 1 plus minus 1 to the n times 2n minus 1 is a multiple of 4. So remember that uh, one of my uh, rules of thumb is to never try to prove something without checking some examples to see what's going on. So let's try some examples. If I take n equals 3, then my number here is 1 plus minus 1 cubed times 2 times 3 is 6 minus 1 is 5 which is 1 minus 5, which is negative 4. And sure enough, that is a multiple of 4. Let's try n equals 4. Then I get 1 plus minus 1 to the 4th times 2 times 4 is 8 minus 1 is 7, which is 1 plus 7, which is 8, which is also a multiple of 4. So, uh, Okay, that's not exactly a proof, but it's at least uh, confidence building. And a natural way to approach this problem if you, is to split it up, is to say, okay, we have our n, and then if n is even, we can simplify this formula. So uh, we have to show in that case that 1 plus 2n minus 1, which is just 2n, is a multiple of 4. And if n is odd, then we have 1 minus 2n minus 1, which is 2 minus 2n is a multiple of 4. So here, uh, this minus sign comes from the fact that if n is odd, minus 1 to the n is odd. And this plus sign comes from the fact that n is even then minus 1 to the n is even. So another way to state this proposition is that um, is it, it really is two propositions. It, the first one is that if n is even, then 2n is a multiple of 4. And if n is odd, then 2 minus 2n uh, is a multiple of 4. And basically, if we uh, this proposition is really of the form, if n is even, then 2n is a multiple of 4. That's one thing. And if n is odd, then 2 minus 2n is a multiple of 4. And we have to check that both of those propositions are true. Um, and, of course, in this case, if n is even, then n is 2 times some other number m, and then 2n is 4m, and so we see that... Uh, in this case, if n is even, then 2n is a multiple of 4. Maybe that's pretty clear. And uh, in the other case, if n is odd, then n is 2m plus 1 for some m. And then 2 minus 2n is 2 minus 2 times 2m plus 1, which is 2 minus 4m minus 2 or minus 4m. So again, it's a multiple of two, 4. 
So that this is the what I call the hidden part of the proof. It's the back of the envelope, except nice scratch paper calculation, so that you can see what it is that's actually going on. And you also notice that that in the odd case, you're going to get a negative. The sign is going to there's a minus sign. So if if uh, and your n is positive because it's a natural number, so you're going to get negative numbers uh, for odd ones and positive numbers for even ones. Um, so now you want to write this up in the form of a proof, and I've done that here. So let's uh, let's walk through this line by line. So what I've done is to name this one plus minus one to the n times two n minus one. I'm going to call it k of n. By giving it a name, I don't have to keep repeating it. Um, and I had to put the n in there because it is a function of n. It depends on n. If you are going to consider cases, you should always say, we consider the cases where n is odd and even separately. And now I work out the calculation that I did earlier. When n is even, k of n is 1 plus 2n minus 1, with the plus sign coming from the minus 1 to the plus is 2n. Since n is even, n is 2m for some m, and therefore k of n is 2 times 2m is 4m, and therefore k of n is a multiple of 4. This is the argument that I gave here. When n is odd, k of n is 1 minus 2n minus 1, which is 2 minus 2n. Since n is odd, n is 2m plus 1 for some m, and therefore k of n is 2 minus 2 times 2m plus 1, is 2 minus 4m minus 2, which is 4m. That's the argument that I gave here. And we see again that k of n is a multiple of 4. And since every integer is either even or odd, we've na uh, every natural number is going to be either even or odd, we've covered all the possible cases. One of the ways you can go wrong in a proof by cases is uh, if your cases don't cover all possibilities. OK, let's look at one other example. Uh, a really fundamental uh, thing that we tend to take for granted, at least I do, which is the triangle inequality. So the triangle inequality says if you have two real numbers, x and y, that the absolute value of x plus y is always less than or equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. And I just want to remind everybody, I hope you know this, but the absolute value is a kind of a super confusing thing because it's defined this way. If x is positive, the absolute value of x is x itself. And if x is negative, the absolute value of x is minus x. So uh, the absolute value of minus 3 is minus minus 3, which is 3. So you see the very definition of the symbol absolute value of x has a case breakdown in it. You can't compute the absolute value of something without first asking is this a negative thing or a positive thing? So um, to attack this, there are, at least at first glance, four cases. The four cases are, and this now, remember, is the, uh, this is the hidden part, the back of the envelope calculation. The four cases are, well, they could both be positive. They could be of different signs in two different ways. Or they could both be negative. And these are the four cases that you have to worry about. And the reason it splits up into these four cases is because, for instance, in this case, the absolute value of x is equal to x, but the absolute value of y is equal to minus y. Whereas in this case, the absolute value of x is equal to minus x, and the absolute value of y is equal to y. And as long as we're doing this, here the absolute value of x is equal to x, and the absolute value of y is equal to y. And here the absolute value of x is equal to minus x, and the absolute value of y is equal to minus y. So there are four cases that we need to look at. Let's look at the... Um, the cases where they're of the same sign first, because uh, in some ways those those are the easiest ones, because if well let's look at the very first one first. If they're both positive, 
right? And this, let's call this case A or case one. In case one, the absolute value of x is equal to x. The absolute value of y is equal to y. But also, the absolute, but x plus y is bigger than or equal to zero because both x and y are. So the absolute value of x plus y is equal to x plus y. And so this is actually an equality. Absolute value of x plus absolute value of y equals absolute value of x plus y. And if we call this case 2 and this case 3 and this case 4, what about case 4? Well, in that case, absolute value of x equals minus x, absolute value of y equals minus y, x plus y is negative, right? It's the sum of two negative numbers. And so the absolute value of x plus y is equal to minus x plus y. And again, this equation becomes sort of automatic, right? It becomes the left-hand side is minus x plus y, and that's actually equal to minus x plus minus y. So in cases 1 and 4, the absolute value of x plus y is actually equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. The only time it gets tricky is when there are differing signs. So just to make this look more formal, so if you think of this as the back of the envelope calculation, at least for the hidden part, at least for cases one and four, then the formal part is we say there are four cases to consider depending on the signs of x and y, and we take them in turn. Case one, x is bigger than or equal to zero and y is bigger than or equal to zero. Notice that I'm labeling the cases. That's really helpful to the reader. Then x plus y is bigger than or equal to zero, and therefore, in this case, absolute value x equals x, absolute value y equals y, absolute value x plus y equals x plus y, and so x plus y equals absolute value of x plus absolute value y. And similarly, this is the argument that I gave when they're both negative. So the interesting case are the cases where there are different signs. So let's look at this one first. x is bigger than or equal to zero, and y is less than zero. And let's do the hidden part of the calculation and see where it gets us. So in this hidden part of the calculation, um, we can look at uh, x plus y, and we have to ask ourselves, what's the sign of x plus y? Because um, in order to compute its absolute value, we need to know its sign. And in this case, we know, and, and of course, there's two possibilities, right? X plus Y could be positive or negative. Or zero. Let's maybe instead of positive, to be strictly correct, I should say non-negative, including zero. And both can happen. And how do we know that both can happen? Well, um, take the case where X is 15 and y is minus 5. Well, in this case, absolute value of x plus y is the absolute value of 10. x plus y is positive, which is 10. On the other hand, the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y would be 15 plus 5, which is 20. So our inequality holds, but the absolute value of x plus y is positive. The other situation is where, for example, x were 15 and y were minus 20. And in this case, the absolute value of x plus y would be the absolute value of minus 5, which is 5. And the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y would be 15 plus 20, which is 35. And again, the inequality would hold. But, uh, but now we have x plus y is positive. So there's, is negative. So there's, there's two cases. This case itself breaks up into two cases. The two cases where x plus y is bigger than or equal to zero. So in this case, the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y is equal to x plus y. 
On the other hand, y, y is negative and x is positive. So this is equal to the absolute value of x minus the absolute value of y. And the other case is where x plus y is less than 0. And in that case, x plus y is minus x plus y, which is minus x minus y, which is minus the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. Well, we're still OK, right? Because the absolute value of x minus the absolute value of y is certainly less than or equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. And the absolute value of, min of absolute value of y minus the absolute value of x is certainly less than or equal to the absolute value of y plus the absolute value of x. So in these two subcases, whichever way it turns out, whether you're in this case or this case, you've still got your inequality checking out. So um, here we have a situation where one of the cases that we had to consider splits up into two cases that we have to consider again. So there are really more than uh, four cases to be considered. So I've written up that solution here. Um, first of all, I observed, I didn't point this out before, but it is true that, it, that in this case, x plus y is less than x. That's because x is positive and y is negative. So if you take x plus y, you're going to get something less than x. And it's bigger than or equal to y because x is positive. So whatever y is, if you add x to it, you're going to be bigger than or equal to y. I don't actually use that fact, so I should probably take it out. So I'm going to erase it. It's true, but it's unnecessary. Now I give the argument that I gave before. If x plus y is bigger than or equal to 0, then the absolute value of x plus y is equal to x plus y, which is the absolute value of x minus the absolute value of y. And that's, in fact, less than or equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y, because the absolute value of y is positive. So when you add something, it, it gets bigger. And similarly, if x plus y is less than 0, then the absolute value of x plus y is minus x minus y, which is absolute value of y minus the absolute value of x, which is less than or equal to the absolute value of y plus the absolute value of x. And now it's worth observing that we're still not done because there's one more case. Here we consider the case where x was bigger than or equal to 0 and y was less than 0. We should also consider the case where x is less than 0 and y is bigger than or equal to 0. What I've written is it follows by the same argument. The point being that if I just went through this paragraph and changed all the x's and y's around, everything would be perfectly symmetrical. Um, and I would still be able, I mean, I wouldn't, there's no new ideas that are required to consider the case where x is less than 0 and y is bigger than or equal to 0. The book points out that a common phrase to use in this situation is without loss of generality. Maybe you've heard this phrase before. And to use that uh, argument, you would do it a little bit differently. You would say there are, before diving into this case, you would say there are two cases remaining where x and y have opposite signs. So that would cover the case x bigger than or equal to 0 and y less than 0, and x less than 0 and y bigger than or equal to 0. Without loss of generality, suppose x is bigger than or equal to 0 and y is less than 0. So the phrase without loss of generality set means to the reader, I am going to make a choice and which doesn't affect the underlying truth of what I'm about to prove, but I'm actually going to sweep something under the rug and hope that you believe me. And it's your job as the reader to check that when a person says without loss of generality, they're not hiding something from you. So there, the without loss of generality, suppose x bigger than or equal to 0 and y less than 0 means there's two cases, and I'm going to pick one of them and prove it, and that's good enough. And as long as that's true, it is good enough, then there's no problem with using without loss of generality. But um, there's an old joke that uh, whenever you hear somebody say without loss of generality, there immediately follows a loss of generality. And that loss is they're going to make an assumption that they're in one of the two cases and not in both. So watch out for that.